So what we're going to do today is first I'm going to give you the overview of anatomy on USMLE and Comlex. And then I'm going to give you a sample size of just high yield topics that you should absolutely memorize. So before we get started, what's today's video going to be about? Well, what you need to know for anatomy is a few things. One is anatomical relationships. And I'm going to explain what that means. But basically, if you have a nerve or a blood vessel that courses through a certain area, and then the area that it's with gets inflamed or gets fractured or whatever, then you need to know that there's going to be pathology. That kind of transitions us into the next point location-specific pathology. Now, when I wrote that, I had more of tumors in mind because certain tumors at certain points of the body cause very classic pathology. Now, the last point to keep in mind is that some tests can have up to 15% of anatomy. Now, that might be unlucky if you don't want to be tested on anatomy because, well, most students don't, but just keep in mind that up to 15% of your tests can be anatomy or anatomy-related topics, and these are self-reported figures from multiple students who have recently taken step one. So why don't we get started with some of our classic um, pathognomonic examples and see how it goes from there. So the first thing that you need to be familiar with is this image on the left. What you see is a humerus and you see a few nerves and blood vessels that course downward as they exit the brachial plexus. This is very, very high yield. You're almost guaranteed to have a question on your test that's going to ask you to interpret knowledge of nerve anatomy in the arm. The radial nerve, the median nerve, and the ulnar nerve all come off the brachial plexus and then move downward towards the manus. So what's important is that you understand where they go. So we're going to start with the radial nerve. The radial nerve comes off the brachial plexus and goes through the spiral groove underneath the armpit. It crosses underneath the mid shaft of the humerus and then reappears over the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. You need to know those three locations. The reason that you need to know them takes us back to my first point. You need to know anatomical relationships and location-specific pathology. For example, if you fracture the mid-shaft of the humerus, you can damage the radial nerve. You need to know that. If you rest your arm on a crutch, you get what's called Saturday night palsy, where you get numbness of the distribution of the radial nerve because you're compressing the radial nerve in the spiral groove. If you have tennis elbow, for example, or lateral epicondylitis, there's a chance that that inflammation can impinge on the radial nerve. And all of these different pathologies would manifest in the distribution of the radial nerve. So a classic example on a test would be that they describe a patient who has radial nerve damage, blah, 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 blah. And then they want you to identify where in the body anatomically that pathology originates from. So I'm going to give you a mnemonic to remember this. You got to remember that the radial nerve goes to the mid shaft, the spiral groove, and the lateral epicondyle, or MSL. My mnemonic is my sexy lingerie because when your girlfriend tells you that she's going to wear my sexy lingerie, you say that's rad. And rad, of course, refers to the radial nerve. Rad, radial, MSL, midshift, spiral, lateral. Take a minute, get it down, but you absolutely need to know this because it is super high yield. If I had to pick any nerve in the body that is the most high yield, I would say it's the radial nerve because it is tied to so many different anatomical locations, but it's distributed very highly in the upper extremity. The next nerve is the median nerve. The median nerve is much simpler. It courses down off the brachial plexus, goes straight down, and then kind of crosses the center region of the distal humerus over the supracondylar process. There are different names for this anatomical region, but supracondylar usually will do you just fine if you memorize that word. So how I remember this is I think about the three raccoons from this movie, and I circle the middle one. The middle for median, and raccoon is in the word supracondylar. I've highlighted it there for you. Of course, I'm missing an O, but raccoon and raccoon sound very similar. Let's switch gears now and move to some tumor pathology. This is really high yield, the pancose tumor. So a pancose tumor is a tumor in the apice of a lung, and the pancose tumor, if you are not familiar, is notorious for causing Horner's syndrome. Now, Horner's syndrome is a classic triad of ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. You need to know what Horner's syndrome is, and more importantly, you need to know that a pancose tumor causes Horner's syndrome. So this takes me back to point two in my opening slide, location-specific pathology, specifically with tumors. The pancose tumor, while very rare in clinical practice, shows up all the time on board exams because of its unique location in the lungs and its unique manifestation in Horner's syndrome. So my mnemonic for remembering this is I think coast and Horner. So pancoast causing Horner syndrome. I think of a hornet or a bee on the coast or on the beach. 
And I just think of this guy is another cartoon from another, I think, Disney movie. But anyway, he's a hornet on the coast. So coast for pancos and hornet for horner syndrome. A pancos tumor causing horner syndrome in the apice of a lung. High yield, gotta know it. We're going to switch gears again and talk about a different organ. Now we're going to talk about the heart. What's most important for you to know about the heart, anatomically speaking, besides where the nodes are and which valve does what, all that stuff that is just like intro to heart, it's heart 101, is you need to know where the different chambers lie, whether they are anterior, whether they are posterior, whether they are lateral. If you get stabbed in this location, which chamber will be hit first? All of these questions appear on tests all the time, but I think that the most high yield is to know that the left atrium is the most posterior chamber. So the mnemonic for this is with left atrium, you want to think about your L's. Left atrium, you think about your L's. The left atrium lies low, or it's posterior, and it lessens the larynx. And what that means is that if you have any issue or any pathology in the left atrium, or any left atrial enlargement, anything like that, it could impede your ability to swallow. So that's why I said lessens the larynx, because what it does is it's going to get bigger, and it's going to open up and kind of compress the esophagus. You can get esophageal manifestations. You can get tracheal manifestations. It doesn't matter. Either way, it's going to make it harder for you to swallow. So that's why I have lessens the larynx because the larynx is the region that controls swallowing and the left atrium makes it more difficult to swallow. So again, left atrium, remember our L's, the left atrium lies low and lessens the larynx. All right, guys. That's all I have for you so far, but there is a much greater list of anatomy that you do need to know. I'm going to make subsequent videos, part two, part three, maybe even part four for high yield anatomy. But why don't we get started with memorizing this list and then we'll reconvene on part two. Good luck.